My dear brothers and sisters, I come to you today as Prime Bishop of the Polish National Catholic Church to share with you some reflection on the solemnity of the institution of the Polish National Catholic Church, which we celebrate in the month of March on the second Sunday, and also in answering our General Synod that desired a greater understanding of our solemnities, a greater understanding of the teachings and position of our Holy Church, we present to you this slide presentation on the life of Bishop Hother and the organization and beginnings of the Polish National Catholic Church. Francis Hother was born in the small village of Żarki, Poland, approximately 30 miles away from Kraków. He was born in a poor village, one where there was not much opportunity, there was not much chance for advancement. It was a farming community, a mining community, and the people there had much difficulty. We know that Francis Hodor, although coming from a poor family without much education, that he, in fact, was a very bright student. Records of his early education were uncovered in Jarki that show that he was quite the promising student. We see here a picture of the small elementary school that he attended. Although he was an educated and smart young man, he was also someone who knew poverty and difficulty at a young age. His father was a miner, a tailor. The family took care of a small plot of land to grow their own vegetables, and they were poor as the majority of the community was poor. Francis Hother at this time also became familiar with the plights of miners and laborers. Jarki was an area, not only then, but right down to today, that is rich in iron ore, rich in coal. So he knew the miners. It is these exact people that many years later he would be ministering to when he ultimately came to Scranton, Pennsylvania. Many of the students that attended that elementary school together with Francis Hother never went on to any other education. But since Franciszek was such a promising student, he had an opportunity that many others did not. We see here an early picture of the Hoder family. His mother and his father seated in front, the other children in his family. We notice that Francis Hoder is not within this picture. At this point, he was probably already off in Krakow, either in high school or possibly even in seminary at the time. It is these members of his family who would, some 30 years later, become pillars in the beginnings of the Polish National Catholic Church in Poland. In particular, his brother Jacob, second from the left, um, would be a part particularly strong force in the Polish National Catholic Church in Poland. As I mentioned, because of his excellent grades and his aptitude, Francis Hother did go on to attend high school at St. Anne's in Krakow, a city approximately 30 to 35 miles away from Żarki. 
since he was poor, he only was able to attend because he received scholarships. He tutored other students for extra funds. These two pictures are present-day pictures of what was St. Anne's High School today, known as the Novodvorsky School. This is still quite a famous school in Poland. Although it began in 1588, at then it was the school for Polish kings and intellectuals today. It is still quite a prestigious private school. Beginning with his time in St. Anne's and even extending, Francis Hoder began his involvement in political aspects. He joined the movement in Kraków of a priest, Father Stanislaw Stoyawski, who was known as the People's Tribune. Although he was involved in Parliament, he was one who fought for the cause of the common people. He believed that they were being oppressed not only by the government, not only through political apparatus, but even they were being oppressed by the church, the organization that should have been encouraging and helping them. In following this movement, Francis Hother eventually realizes the call of God. He will serve the people as Father Stoyawoski did. So in that same manner as Father Stoyawoski, he entered the seminary and enrolled in the Jagiellonian University. Also during this time, he not only worked in the political arena, but also was influenced very strongly by Polish poets and reformers. He studied the works and writings of these great Polish writers. The poets, Mishkevich and Słowacki, influenced him greatly as they wrote that the church must not only point to a salvation which lies beyond the grave in the kingdom of heaven, but they are also to be an example on earth. They are to show forth the way that we are to live and be a support here. That truer vision of what the church is, is what Francis Hother strived after. Many years later, in St. Stanislaus Cathedral in Scranton, he would place two of those poets in stained glass windows. These stained glass windows still grace the cathedral in Scranton. On the left, Adam Michkevich. On the right, Julia Słowacki. As I had said, Francis Hother entered the seminary again, uh, receiving his records there, we know that he excelled in his studies. But there were difficulties. He was still secretly working with Father Stoyawoski in the area of Kraków. And ultimately he became involved in food strikes at the seminary. Movements to increase the living conditions of the students. And because of these two things, his way to advancement in the seminary was blocked and he was removed. We see in this picture Father Hodor together, or student Hodor at the time, together with a number of other students at the Jagiellonian, friends of his. And we know that he kept up correspondence with a few of them many years later. We see him wearing the clerical collar here, knowing that he received his minor orders, but he was not ordained either to the diaconate or the priesthood. And so he decided in December of 1892, he traveled to Gdansk and left Poland for the United States. 
Francis Holder arrived in America in 1893 in March. As was customary for those who were poor, he remained on Ellis Island. There he published small articles in some local Polish newspapers, waiting to be sponsored so that he could actually come into the mainstream of American life. Ultimately, he was sponsored by a priest uh, of the Diocese of Scranton, a priest who resided in Nanticoke, Pennsylvania, Father Benvenuto Gramlevich. Student Francis Hoder came with Father Gramlevich to Nanticoke. He was introduced to the Bishop of the Diocese of Scranton, and he spent a short time finishing his studies at St. Vincent's Abbey in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. He was there from April to August, 1893. Another testimony to his intelligence, to his working hard as a student. In just those few short months, he completed his studies and he was ordained first to the diaconate and finally to the priesthood on August 19th, 1893, at St. Peter's Cathedral in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He was assigned to Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary Parish in South Scranton, and there as the assistant pastor, he began to work with the people of the church. He worked with them not only in the celebration of liturgy, but in literary societies and theater societies. He raised up the level in education and sophistication of the people by that work that he did among them. A bit of background to what was occurring in many of the Polish communities, not only in Scranton, Pennsylvania, where now Father Hulder was, but throughout many of the Polish ethnic communities. Those Polish people were discriminated against because of their different language, their different culture, their different lifestyle. We also know that this was true not only of the Poles, but many other ethnic communities that were coming to America around the same time, the Lithuanians, the Slovaks, the Czechs, and the Italians. These people often turned to the one place where they thought they would get support, to the church, but they often did not find it there. These communities, in many places, began to organize their own parishes with clergy that they knew and they loved and respected, and those parishes being separate from the Roman Catholic Church. An example of four of the largest such organized parishes in the United States, in Chicago, in Buffalo, in Cleveland, and in Detroit. In those areas, there were not only one parish, but small groups of parishes. There were also many individual parishes scattered throughout the areas where the ethnic people had settled. Later, we know that Father Hoder would visit, visit many of these parishes, many of these areas. He would either incorporate those parishes into the Polish National Catholic Church or work together with those immigrant communities in an effort to build parishes. Now back to Scranton, Pennsylvania. In the fall and summer of 1896, when Father Holder had already moved on, he was assigned to Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary Parish in 1893 and spent around two years there. He had spent a short time in Holy Family Parish in Scranton and then had moved on as finally pastor of a parish in Nanticoke, Pennsylvania. But in 1896, the members of Sacred Hearts of Jesus in Mary Parish had a dispute with their pastor and the bishop. The 
the pastor would not listen to their concerns about the management of the parish. They would not listen to their demands to be a part of what went on. They were not being fed and nurtured in their own language. And so that dispute ended in a bloody fight in August of 1896. Those people finally decided to organize and build their own parish. They would buy a few lots of property right around the corner from Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary Parish and begin to build St. Stanislaus Parish. Needing a priest to lead them, they would ask their former assistant, Father Francis Huther, who was at that point in Nanticoke, to come and be their pastor. On March 14th, Francis Huther came to visit the people of St. Stanislaus in a church that at that point was not fully constructed. He would speak to them about the difficulties that would face them. And they decided that they would both give the one week as a time to consider this. And so on March 21st, Father Hother came back to St. Stanislaus. He celebrated Mass there in the basement of the uncompleted church. And from that point, they would strike out together. From that very beginning, St. Stanislaus Parish, especially in administrative and social matters, would be run in a democratic fashion. A parish committee was elected, and we see in the picture that first committee in 1897, Francis Hoder and that group of men of the parish. Father Hoder also wrote the first constitution, um, just first a constitution of the parish. That, though, would later become the model for other parishes in the church, and finally, as a constitution for the entire Polish National Catholic Church. Right from the very beginning of the organization of St. Stanislaus Parish, Father Huther was involved in a number of publication efforts. These kind of regular, even weekly publications were a critical part of his work of spreading the message, of encouraging other ethnic communities to organize their own parish. Father Hodder began publishing the Straj, the Guard, in April of 1897, within one month of the organization of St. Stanislaus Parish. He used it as a publishing arm to bring forward his teachings, his striving for a democratic church. We also know that many publications would follow after. Uh, later, the Tribuna, a monthly publication, uh, yearly calendars were published uh, that were rather large calendars filled with information and articles on the church as well as a uh, yearly calendar. Not pictured here was a publication uh, during World War II that was published just for the soldiers, Onward Christian Soldier. We also see on the right-hand side, finally, in December of 1923, God's Field, Rolla Boja, became the official publication of the church. We know that in just the 30 years of publication, of beginning in, in 1923 and continuing to Bishop Hother's death in 1953, thousands of articles were written by him in its pages. This publication is still today the official publication of the church. It is published in a small run of a hard copy publication and primarily can be received online. 
We also know that not only these weekly and monthly publications, but many other publications were done as well. Catechisms, books, pamphlets, all bringing forward the message of the Polish National Catholic Church. Beginning early on in the movement of the Polish National Catholic Church, Father Hoder wrote what he referred to as his National Church Program. At this time, a, a few parishes were together with him in the local Scranton area, and he laid out this example uh, of how the early church was organized and put it forward in more modern thinking for the church today. He had hoped that a separate church would not be necessary, that the officials of the Roman Catholic Church, both here in the United States as well as in the Vatican, would agree to this way forward. Four points made this up. The legal ownership of church properties by the people. Those who built those parishes and supported those parishes and worshipped in those parishes and made up those parishes would be the legal owners of the property. Parish government and secular matters by elected committees. As we know, Father Huller had a committee for administrative and secular matters right from the beginnings of St. Stanislaus Parish, and that those people who had a stake in the running of their, their parish and supporting it would be able to govern those administrative and social matters. Number three, the appointment of priests approved by parishioners. One concern of those early members of St. Stanislaus was that they were not well ministered to by those who could not speak the Polish language or desired not to be a part of their daily lives. And so the parishioners would have a say in the priests that would guide them and encourage them. And lastly, number four, the appointment of Polish bishops. Um, bishops, as he said, from within the nation, meaning Polish bishops for Polish people. Although there were possibly a 100,000 Polish immigrants in the United States, uh, many parishes, many priests who were here from Poland. One thing was true at this time. There were absolutely no Polish bishops in the United States, no bishop, bishops of a Polish background. And they realized that in order to have some strength to this position, they would need those Polish bishops. Bishop Huther ultimately took this plan to the Vatican, to the headquarters of the Roman Catholic Church, left it there in hopes that it would be accepted by the Pope, by the leaders of the Church. It was ultimately rejected, both by the Vatican and here in the United States. It was that rejection that ultimately led to the excommunication of Bishop Hother by the Roman Catholic Church in the United States. As time continued, the Polish National Catholic Church began to grow. It grew not only amongst Polish people, but other ethnic groups as well, as we had mentioned, the Lithuanians, the Czechs, the Slovaks, and even the Italians. It began with parishes in the area of Scranton, Pennsylvania, in northeast Pennsylvania. They were some of the first to join, but as the movement continued to spread, it began to spread throughout the United States. Those independent parishes, those other small groups, began to join together. Also in time, other like-minded priests began to join together with Father Hother. We see in this picture an early picture of some of those priests gathered together. Bishop Huther traveled in an effort to bring those 
parishes together. He traveled throughout the United States, visiting areas where there were independent parishes, visiting groups who were considering starting new parishes. We see here uh, just two examples of what could be hundreds of examples. We see uh, Bishop Huller at Holy Mother of the Rosary Cathedral in Buffalo, New York. In the lower picture, Bishop Huller at our Savior on Golgotha Parish in Detroit. We know that these were independent parishes that joined with the church. We also know that uh, he visited many groups of just immigrant people. And out of those visits, churches began. The first synod of the Polish National Catholic Church occurred in 1904. We can sometimes think that this was the true point of the Polish National Catholic Church becoming its own church. We see in the picture St. Stanislaus Parish with the clergy and delegates in front. In 1904, 15 parishes uh, were represented at this synod, 145 delegates, and there were 16 clergy there. Four major decisions came out of this synod. Number one, a decisive break with the Roman Catholic Church. As I had said, it was hoped early on that the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church, the bishops, and ultimately the Vatican would accept the program by which the church was being grown, the national church program. Since it was not, the synod decided that they would break decisively, that they would no longer look to the Roman Catholic Church. Number two, Father Huller was elected as the bishop of the church. Number three, they accepted a church constitution based closely on the original constitution of St. Stanislaus Parish. This constitution now would not be for individual parishes what, what, what would be for the movement as a whole. And lastly, as each parish in administrative and social matters was governed by an elected committee, the entire church in administrative and social matters would be governed by what was known then as the Great Council, known today as the Supreme Council. They too were elected at this first synod in 1904. A few years after being elected as bishop, Bishop Hulder was consecrated. In 1907, Bishop Hulder traveled to Utrecht, Holland, to the old Catholic Church of the Netherlands, and there received his Episcopal consecration. We see there Bishop Hulder in his vestments at the conclusion of that consecration. We also see the picture of St. Gertrude's Cathedral in Holland, where that consecration took place. The important aspects of this were that now the Polish National Catholic Church had apostolic succession. Bishop Hulder was not just elected bishop, but he was consecrated bishop by other bishops in an order which goes down to the time of the Apostles. Its orders because of this were now unquestionable. And the church could grow even stronger, even more quickly, because now Bishop Holder did not depend on priests that would come to him from the Roman Catholic Church, but a seminary could be founded and he could ordain his own priests. We know, especially after this consecration, the church continued to grow in the United States, especially throughout the 20s and 30s. The growth was very strong. New parishes were organized. Former independent parishes were joining with the Polish National Catholic Church. We see here Bishop Hulder visiting St. Valentine's Parish in Philadelphia. 
we see on the right uh, the building of a parish. We're not sure what parish that is, but we see the individuals with even the crude way in which they could, with carts and horses, were desiring to build parishes, and through that labor and toil, they were able to construct them and join the In time, the Polish National Catholic Church was also taken to Poland. In 1921, priests from the United States were sent there. They began to organize parishes, and they founded a seminary. We see in the, the large picture the Warsaw Synod in 1928, with Bishop Huther in the middle. We also see... Two people from the right of Bishop Hother is his brother, uh, Jacob Hother. On the right-hand side, we see the cathedral in Warsaw, which is the Holy Ghost Cathedral. The church grew in Poland as well, but we know also that Poland had to deal with the devastation uh, in particular of World War II. Many of the Church buildings were bombed. Many of the priests were killed, captured. Um, ultimately, we know that even um, one of the bishops of our church, Bishop Havdesky, was arrested by the communist government and ultimately killed in prison as the one of the first martyrs of the Polish National Catholic Church, especially among the clergy. In time, the church had to modify its structure in order to keep up with its growth. In 1924, it was decided that the church had grown to a point where Bishop Hother could no longer govern it uh, on his own from Scranton. So two other dioceses were instituted, the Western and Eastern. Two other bishops were also consecrated at the same time, a bishop for Poland and also uh, a bishop for the Lithuanian parishes. We know that those other ethnic groups had come to the Polish National Catholic Church, the largest of which was the Lithuanians, and so they received their own bishop as well. The Polish National Catholic Church from its earliest times was at the forefront of many changes that were occurring in Catholic worship. And these weren't in fact changes, but were restorations of many of the practices of the early church. In 1901, the Mass in the vernacular, the Mass in Polish, was used for the first time at St. Stanislaus Parish. Although it was not an overnight change from Latin to Poland, uh, Polish in time, more and more Polish was being used in the liturgy. Liturgy was also in the vernacular languages of other ethnic groups that joined Lithuanian, Slovak, and Italian. In 1931, an altar of sacrifice was introduced at St. Stanislaus again in the model of the early church. We see in the picture Francis Hoder um, praying at that altar. The sacrament of the word of God was instituted to show the importance of Holy Scripture. We know that preaching, especially in the Roman Catholic Church, was not very prized and Bishop Holder desired to change that. And so the Polish National Catholic Church considers the Word of God heard and preached, the homilies, the sermons, to be a true encounter with Jesus Christ, as are the other sacraments. We also know that within the early, one of the earliest missals of the Church, the large missal of 1931, different cycles of readings were given for the Sundays of the year. 
This allowed the congregation to hear not just the same readings of scripture each year, but other readings to expand the exposure to Holy Scripture. The church continued on in its synodal structure and synodal governance. Following the leadership of Bishop Alder, the, the, syn the synods continued to do many things, as was already mentioned in 1909. The word of God heard and preached was proclaimed to be a sacrament in the same way that the other sacraments are. Bishop Hoder penned a confession of faith of the Polish National Catholic Church in and before the year 1912. He had brought it to a number of provincial synods to discuss it. Finally, in 1913, that confession of faith was accepted for the entire church. We know in 1921, mandatory celibacy for the clergy was abolished. The church also added a number of special feast days at the request of Bishop Holder that these feasts be instituted. Those for the institution, the Feast of Brotherly Love and Christian Family. The church is one that very much cared for its people, and in fact still does. We see here Bishop Hother blessing the Spunia Farm property that was purchased by the church and the Polish National Union in 1929. That property was used as a place for uh, the elderly and the infirm where they could go, uh, to live out their lives when they had no one to care for them. It was a place where the youth could go to spend a bit of time away in recreation. It was a place where all the members of the church could go on vacation to go and receive uh, spiritual sustenance and also to enjoy themselves. We know that the youth of the church from its very beginning have been an important part we see here the Polish children's camp. Bishop Hother in the middle with a number of clergy and the youth who stayed there. And over time, the uh, church has also expanded these programs. That particular camp building no longer exists at Spunia Farm and has now been replaced by the Bishop Hother Retreat and Recreation Center, a much more modern facility. We also know its youth programs have expanded to youth convocations and diocesan youth retreats and the Cordes encampment. A number of societies were organized by Bishop Hother for the members of the church, the women, the men, and the youth. The first society was the Society for the Adoration of the Most Blessed Sacrament which was organized in the very first month of the church, the Society for the Women of the Church. From its constitution, we read, the women should realize that the altar in which Christ dwells in sacramental form, the lighted candles that they hold in their hands while adoring God, the help they give to a sister in need are external and small acts but they form the rungs of a ladder which leads to God, the source of truth and happiness. This society was organized for the women that they could be lifted up in their position in the church. The women oftentimes in other churches were treated poorly, but in the Polish National Catholic Church, they are a vital part of all that we are as delegates at synods, as members of this organization serving uh, on parish committees. The Polish National Union of America is the second organization. Following the organization of the church in 1897, a number of different Polish fraternal organizations that were active in the United States were supportive of the church the largest of which was the Polish National Alliance. 
Unfortunately, that support was removed when the Roman Catholic Church in 1908 consecrated its first Polish bishop, a suffragan bishop for the Diocese of Chicago. The, that fraternal organization abandoned many of the Polish National Catholics and ultimately they were discriminated against and many lost the means of support or insurance. Bishop Huller decided to organize his own fraternal organization, the Polish National Union, at that same, in that same year as well. It provides support to help to the people of the church. Um, it was organized to provide those things that they could not get anywhere else. And of course we know that the Polish National Union still contributes to the work of the Polish National Catholic Church right down to the present day in providing support and help to the people of the church, in offering loans and help to the parishes. It is still very strong in its support. The third society was the Young Men's Society of Resurrection. On the eve of World War I in 1914, Bishop Hoder organized this society as a support to the men of the church. He realized that many of them would be drafted, many of them would be going off to war, and that they needed this support. From their constitution, we read, We need an organization that will be committed to this cause, one that will gather the youth under its banner, inspire them with a spirit of solidarity, perseverance, and in moments of doubt and weakness would assist, uplift, and then again lead them to a better and brighter tomorrow. This organization, too, still continues on in support of the men of the Polish National Catholic Church. We come now to the last moments of Bishop Holder's life. We see in the picture the last photograph that was taken of Bishop Holder before his death on February 16, 1953. He died at the Cathedral Rectory in Scranton. But we know that the church that he organized did not die with him. The Polish National Catholic Church continues on in its strong profession of faith, its strong belief in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and in its assertion that God's people have rights, and those rights must be respected and preserved. We also can take a look at just a few of the teachings of Bishop Hodder, especially as they are continued to live out in the church today. We know that as a Catholic, Bishop Hodder's spirituality was especially liturgically based. He wrote in his Confession of Faith, I believe that every Christian should take an active and vital part in the spiritual life of the church. And he gives that in three ways, by hearing the word of God, receiving the sacraments, fulfilling the rules and regulations established by Christ and the apostles and given by the church. We know that so many special masses were written in celebration of that liturgical life, those special solemnities of humble shepherds, the institution of the PNCC, Feast of the Fatherland, Feast of Brotherly Love, and Feast of Christian Family, liturgical celebrations for the American holidays of Independence Day, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, and Thanksgiving, and other special celebrations as well. In the 1931 Missal, there are celebrations for the days of the 13th to the 20th. We remember those are the days that Father Hother, then France, uh, then Father Hother, uh, spent time in contemplation before taking on the pastorship of Saint Stanislaus. He took that on on March 21st, and there is a special commemoration of that first Holy Mass, which he refers to as a day of a new spirit. We also know 
in honor of the differing theology of the Polish National Catholic Church in one place in regard to the teaching on the Blessed Virgin Mary that on December 8th in that 1931 Missal, the Feast of Divine Love and Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, in that feast is honored that special love of God as he begins through Mary to reach down into humanity and in a special way reaches out to the Blessed Virgin who will ultimately be the mother of Jesus Christ. We know that in his teachings the Word of God played such an important role. We can read from Bishop Huther's writings on the resolutions of the 1906 Synod before even the Word of God was proclaimed as a sacrament, we still see the high regard in which Bishop Huther holds Holy Scripture. We read in that second paragraph, Listen to and read much about God and his relationship to the humankind. Above all, on holy days, we should hear and read the Word of God. If we cannot be present in church where the clergy read and put forth the teachings of Jesus Christ and close in the Gospels, the letters of the Apostles, the Revelation and the Acts of the Apostles, then we are to do this at home, within the family, but without ceremony. We should not be without the Word of God on a holy day. And Bishop Hulder lists for us the importance of that Word of God. It is the food of the world. It points out to us our bond with God. It lights the way, leading us through life's storms and hardships to and beyond the gate of eternity, and it teaches us religious and social duties. We also see here in the publication Our Faith, Bishop Huller, in mentioning all of the sacraments of those liturgical churches of the Roman, Eastern, and Old Catholic he also adds at the end, to these we add the great sacrament of the hearing of the word of God. And now we come, my brothers and sisters, to the end of our presentation. Today, others continue to carry on the work of the Polish National Catholic Church. The clergy, myself as prime bishop, my brother bishops, the many dedicated priests and deacons of our Holy Church, and you, my brothers and sisters, who continue to work and strive to build up the kingdom of God as we find it right around ourselves in our parishes. I encourage each and every one of you to spread the message of our Polish National Catholic Church, to be an active and vital part in your worship on Sunday and holy days of obligation, in your participating in the parish meetings, the society meetings, the diocesan and national synods, the work of the commissions of our church. There are so very many ways to be involved and also to spread the message of the Polish National Catholic Church in how you live your life each and every day. Share with your family, your friends, your neighbors, and those you come into contact with the good things occurring in our Holy Church. And now, my brothers and sisters, let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your grace and your blessing upon the bishops, priests, deacons, and every member of the Church. Strengthen us as we continue to carry forth the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. As we honor this week, on this second Sunday of March, the anniversary of God's call to us, let us take that call and continue to spread the news, spread the good news of Jesus Christ and his holy church. Amen.